I've got my Panasonic serial incremental motor here connected to a Zenus XEL 230-18. Um, the stow bypass jumper is connected. I've got 24 volts connected for keep alive power. And it's also providing power to the brake. So when the drive is disabled, the brake will come on. When it's enabled, the brake will turn off. Uh, if I had a large inertia, I'd have a regen resistor connected, but uh, we're just doing the motor today. AC power, uh, motor power wires with the uh, ground connected. The motor uh, cable came with a ground, which is actually connected to the case. That's interesting. Normally, the ground is not connected to the case. Normally, when you bolt the motor to the frame, you get a path to the case for earth. Um, so, yeah, we have a brake. We have a feedback. It's a serial communication protocol and the motor power wires. Uh, I also have uh, earth connected to the chassis. There's a, a terminal for connecting earth. So I just put a screw there and bolted it down um, using the serial communication link to talk to the drive. This is a USB to serial adapter. So that's it for the, um, the setup there. I found the Panasonic data for this MSM E042G1 motor. So there's some specs in here. Uh, rated current, 2.4 amps RMS. Multiply that by the square root of 2 to get the continuous current. And then we have a peak current um, capable of the motor. You can see it's a 20-bit incremental. So it has 1,048,576 counts per rev. Um, there's not a lot of good K sub E's, K sub T, but it is a 200 volt motor with a rated 400 watt output. So you can see the current from that. Uh, given the current and the newton meters, you can do newton meters per amp. From that, you can get volts per kRPM. I measured the resistance and guessed at the inductance. So Let's take a look at how to wire up this uh, serial incremental encoder. So here's the serial incremental A. We tested the Panasonic incremental A. And here's the wiring diagram. So the encoder has data plus and minus, goes to the Copley data plus and minus, which gets into the drive. It's a bi-directional communication. There's 0 and 5 volts for ground. There's a shield, which connects to the Copley to find the path to Earth and may presumably connect at the motor. So let's take a look at how to set up CME2. So the basic setup, it's a brushless rotary motor. There are halls. This, this is part of the incremental format is you get hall indicators with your incremental encoder. It's all over the serial port though. So it's on the motor and we can do a CAN application and we can even emulate the output if you want. So on the motor data, uh, we've come up with the volts per uh, newton meters per amp. Same for the volts per radians per second. That decodes into 40 volts per kRPM. I measured the resistance, guessed at the inductance, set a max speed, put in the peak and continuous torque, got the inertia off the data sheet there. Um, they give it to us in kilogram meters squared times 10 to the minus 4, which turns out to be 0.28 kilogram centimeters squared. The feedback device is 20 bits. 2 to the 20 is 1048576. And this has a break, so I put a typical stop time and a speed I want to come to before I turn the brake on, and a delay while I wait for the electromechanical time constant of the solenoid to engage. And so this thing will stop and hold without falling. So that, that's a cool feature. We can hear the little click um, when we enable it. So on the manual phasing screen, you can enable and uh, check the phasing. Um, if it's wired, you know, it should all be configured properly. Um, when you go forward, counts should go up. The hall indicator should slightly lead or lag the indicator. It should be balanced whether you go forward or reverse. And you can invert things to change the direction and uh, make corrections if required. 
So for the calculated values, uh, we get some pretty good tuning. Uh, the current loop bandwidth is a little low. Um, So it's only 200 hertz, so we'll definitely want to tune that. Um, I'm going to say 4,000 RPM. Um, it's not complaining about that. Ah, there we go. Now I've only got 120 volts AC. Uh, actually, a high line. I got 192 volts. So it's just letting us know this might be a problem to hit that speed. Uh, you can set a little more reasonable tracking window and. We'll play with the gains in a minute. I'm going to take off the, oops, low gain shift. So, uh, let's get right to some tuning here. Function generator apply to the current loop. Auto setup checkbox. Hit start. So the proportional gain might be a little bit low. Not too much integral. Cut that back down. Too much proportional. Cut that back down. That's pretty good. Should give us about a kilohertz of current leap bandwidth if you want to check the uh, bandwidth again. Velocity parameters, I'm just going to cool off the acceleration and deceleration a little bit here. Um, we'll do 4 hertz. Auto setup checkbox, 500 RPM. So it'll bang back and forth. Let's look at the actual current to do this. And wow, there you go. So maybe that's why we got the low gain shift connected here, because the um, lots of counts per rev. There we go. So we're back down to the normal gain range there. So I'm going to cut this in. It's a little buzzy. So the gain's a little high for the proportional. I like to cut it in half, but we're going to take a quick look at the velocity loop output filter. If I move it to a single pole, it may get a little less ringy. That pushes the velocity loop bandwidth out a little bit. Um, looks like it's still a little bit hotly tuned. Oh, yeah, so there we go. A little better. And uh, let's give it a little bit of integral there. So good steady state. Nice and flat. Not a lot of overshoot or ringing. I'd say that's a pretty stiff velocity loop. So we can make a relative move of one rev, and you can see the indicator on the motor is sticking straight up there. So it made one rev. I'm going to do 10 revs, still up, and 100 revs, and you should get a good, uh, still lands in the same position. I can go to absolute zero here. Stop trace auto setup checkbox. Look at the current, actual current. We'll make a little move here and we'll look at the tuning response there. So the velocity loop has a little bit of integral here. If you had a load, you might might want to take that down a little bit. Let's go a little bit further. So I should have a little bit of following error um, during the move. So that looks uh, like a lot of counts. So we can crank up a little bit of proportional gain there. Okay, I'm gonna we'll do the position loop tuning in a second here. I just want to show you a cool feature of the absolute encoder. Uh, we can move it off of center there, and we do home to, to an index, home the next index, so it can find the index marker uh, over the serial connection to the encoder. So that's our absolute zero position there, plus or minus whatever the 
estimation is it's a million counts per rev, so it's probably plus or minus 100 counts or so. Um, so from the ASCII command line, I can get from RAM 0x68, and that's the position capture um, of the index. I'll go the other way. So I'm capturing the index position at plus or minus a couple hundred counts. Uh, that, that seems pretty normal and pretty, pretty repeatable. Uh, the important thing is we're not losing counts. It's just uh, so if I go to an absolute position, sticking straight up again, whether it's 10 or 100 or 1,000 revs, I still land in the same position, plus or minus 200 counts. Um, so for the tuning, we'll just do 10 revs here. And we'll look at the response. I noticed the integral gain was a little high because at the end of the move, I got an integral bump up. So I'm just going to cut that in half. Right, do the move again and see what that does for us. And uh, oh, a little bit too much. Um, the proportional gain at some point will oscillate. Take a look to see where that is. So the integral gets rid of the steady state error. So maybe a little too much integral. It, you know, this depends on whether you have a load or not. I've got no load. Uh, so when you hook up a large inertia, this might come down. Uh, the value of VP can't be taken up too high. It gets real buzzy. Um, the proportional gain is definitely too high for large inertia. So if you're going to hook up a larger inertia, let's just leave the default 1,000 and bring it down if required. Um, so during the constant velocity, the following error looks pretty good. And after the move, a little, a little time to get to steady state. Again, one cool feature about this uh, serial incremental is that we can output an emulated uh, incremental count based off the serial data we get. But just keep in mind that a million counts per rev times 10 revs a second is 10 million counts per second. Some controllers can't handle the high frequency. So there's a parameter 5a, which has a count divide by which can, uh, you know, cut the, uh, the count rate out. Um, so you could home the motor, uh, maybe configure the drive input with a CVM to home the motor, and then receive counts to your controller from a home, known home position. Um, there's multiple homing methods, and then the count divide to reduce the counts per rev. Um, but there's also simulated encoder burst current position on encoder output at rising edge. Um, I don't have all the details of this, but this will burst out at so many megahertz the counts to get to the zero position from the power up position. Um, of course, this is not an absolute encoder, it's a serial incremental. So even if you're at a unknown position, uh, when you reset the drive, it should come back up. Uh, oh, looks like it's a single turn absolute. Let's see if that's true. No, not true. So it always comes up at zero. So that's it for Panasonic incremental. Um, apparently, they have absolute encoders too. Multi-turn, probably needs a battery. Um, this is good for a lot of applications. Uh, reduces wire count, so that's a good feature. And a lot of distributors carry this Panasonic motor. Thanks for your time. Enjoy your Panasonic.